take over if anyone oh. well now i'm live <laughs> hello everybody and welcome to my takeover if anybody is there um i'm actually not sure if i can see anybody in the chat at the moment let's see yeah no comments well might be an interesting and calming 45 minutes let's see so if anyone is watching but not commenting ah okay makes sense hello facebook user it's i jm clark um i'm here for the takeover this is sort of a uh, ask me anything or at least that's what i'm told so what i'm going to be doing is uh talking a little bit about what my books are and what i'm working on and then um uh, Folks here can ask me questions, uh, depending on if people wish to do that, of course. So let's get started. So if, to anyone who is in the chat at the moment and doesn't know who I am, I am J.M. Clark, the author of Mark of the Fool and Rune Seeker. Uh, I, you might also know me as Unstoppable Juggernaut on Royal Road, uh, which I didn't use on Amazon because that would be highly actionable by Disney since that is a Marvel character. But, uh, you know, we all have to, uh, make our adjustments. So the, so yes, so Mark of the Fool and Rune Seeker. Mark of the Fool was a series that I started, uh, three years ago on Royal Road, it has been published for two years. And now there is Rune Seeker, which is published all of since last week. So that is, uh, the way I, so that is me. Um, I, hey, Jay, how's it going? How's it going? The, we're just here. We're having a time. It's just going to be, it's a sort of an ask me anything. So if anyone has any questions for the writer of Mark of the Fool. Um, ooh, yes, on your Audible account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, actually, uh, good good timing with that. Uh, you'll have to excuse me for a moment while I shill horribly while you're my captive audience. But uh, the Fool audiobook, book four of that, has actually come out today. So that has been narrated by the always wonderful Travis Baldry. So, and that is finally on sale. Uh, Travis is a wonderful narrator and narrates a lot of series for a lot of very fantastic authors. So it came out a little bit after the ebook did, but uh, here we are. So, yes. So, yeah, um, I'm also working on uh, some other projects. Uh, I have another progression fantasy series coming out probably next year called Oaths, Blood, and Coin, which is being in, which is being recorded right now by our narrator I'm very excited about. Ah, Jay Barras. Yes. Oh, Jay. I have to admit, brother, but I haven't gotten to Mark of the Fool on my to-be-listened yet. You're, but you're there. I hear good things. Well, uh, those people that said good things are lying to you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no, no. I'm sure you'll get to it. Listen, listen. My to-be-read list and to-be-listened list is incredibly, embarrassingly long. I have books on there that I thought, I'll get to this, like, tomorrow. And that was five years ago. So trust me, I know how it is. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Take your time, my friend. There's lots of great books out there, and I'm sure you'll get to be eventually. Or not. It is a free country, and I am not here to dictate to you what till you listen to. But yeah, so I've got that on the back burner, and uh, that's basically it. So like, if, to anyone who doesn't uh, know what Mark of the Fool or Rune Seeker is... Uh, yeah, who doesn't know what Mark of the Fool or Rune Seeker is? Uh, Mark of the Fool um, is a progression fantasy series, a fusion of a Magic Academy slice of life and action series, with its main point being that the main character, Alex Roth, is a chosen one who is chosen by the gods, like your classics, all your classic uh, old fantasy novels, except the key with him is that he says no that he's going to do his own thing. So instead of going along with destiny, he decides to go on his own route. Now, the thing is with the mark is that, uh, ooh, ah, ah, we have a question. Thank God I don't have to ramble endlessly. <laughs> All right, Facebook user, my friend. 
you just started on Royal Road because, and the you just started on Royal Road. And do you know if you're doing well there when starting out, or how do you know when you're doing well when you're starting out? Oh well, well, Facebook user, you're not taking it easy on me <laughs> right from the get go. That's actually a bit of a difficult question. The thing that I think I'm gonna turn it back to you a little bit. I'll, I'll actually no, better I give two scenarios. If you're writing for a hobby, because everyone forgets that people write for hobby, uh, then you honestly are doing well if you're enjoying the story and you're enjoying the engagement that you're getting with your audience on Royal Row. That's your only metric for success. But if you're talking dollars, moolah, Patreon, and eventual Amazon, well, that's a bit of a different, uh, bit of a different animal. So then the answer for that is honestly a bit complex as well. It depends on what you're writing. If you're writing a lit RPG, um, especially the classic kind, like a power fantasy lit RPG, then it really depends on if you've gotten onto Rising Stars and you're doing well on there. And by doing well, I mean having an increase of followers. Most of the time... Um, I really don't want to say this is a standard for success because if if I give out a number that insults people that have a different view of what the number for success would be, I'll just say this. If you have a Patreon that hits your particular goal for what monetary earnings you want from Royal Road and from serialization, then congratulations, you've succeeded. Um, if you have a story that has tons and tons and tons of followers and no one is on your Patreon, then and that's what you want, you want to earn money from your story, then something might have gone wrong there. So essentially, I would say that if you're looking for popularity and Patreon money, if you've gotten on Rising Stars, that's your first gateway to success. If you've gotten enough followers that you have patrons that are paying you close to your initial goal, then I would say that that's also a gateway to success. But I will also have one caveat there. A lot of people will start a story on Royal Road and want to be shared alone within the first month. Uh, oh, 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 so you do not want a Patreon. You love writing, hated editing, you fall in love with writing again. Ah, I see. Well then, truthfully, you likely, if then in that case, what your likely measure for success is, is simply put, if people are reading your story, if you're enjoying your interactions with them and uh, how your story is doing on there, if you have enough readers to make you feel, yeah, I've got eyeballs on my story, then you've had a success. I have a story on Royal Road that when I finished publishing it, I think it had about 600 followers, up to 1,200 now. And my only goal of that story was to have people read and enjoy it. It was very highly rated, and I call that a success. Mark of the Fool has 15,000 followers. That's also a success by a completely different metric. So only you can say what your measure of success will be, my friend. And that would be my answer. Bit of a cop-out, but that's the one I'm sticking with. Anyone else have any questions, or shall I start rambling again? <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so uh, what else is, what else can I talk about here while I'm waiting for someone else to ambush me with the next question? Oh, you're most welcome, Facebook user. You're most welcome indeed. Um, I hope I can be of help to you. And because trust me, uh, when you're first starting off with any sort of writing, whether it's Royal Road or Amazon or even just writing something down in the diary, it can be a scary process. So I hope that I've added a little bit of guiding light to your journey, my friend. Alrighty. So speaking of journeys, I guess I can talk a little bit about my original start on Royal Road um, before there was even a mark of the fool. Um, so I got started on Royal Road about a year before Mark of the Fool actually published. And you have to understand, things were a bit different back then. Uh, there were less people going to Amazon, and there were more people writing as a hobby. Remember I said, people too do do that. And for me, I came on there to 
publish a little ah how old were you when you made your first book here we go all right so uh i am <laughs> i call myself embarrassingly ancient um but uh I, I guess I'm like not, I'm kind of middle of the road in terms of author ages. So full disclosure, um, I'm about 35 years old now and I finished my first novel. Oh, geez. I hadn't published that one, but I finally hit the finish line of the very first book that I made it to the end to. It was 2015 or so. And my mind keeps telling me that was like three years ago, but no, no, JM, that was eight years ago. Uh, that, so back then I would have been about 26, 27, I think it was, when I finally finished my first novel. I'd started my first ones, oh geez, when I was like 12 or 13 years old, but uh, I finally finished at that age, which can, but you know, I've known kids that have published novels at 17 or 18 years old. So it just varies. Um, <laughs> Jay Baraz, you have to, uh, you have to have a young heart, I guess. Um, at least that's what I tell myself, but then all my friends are, who are Zoomers remind me that I'm ancient quite regularly. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, Joseph. Yeah, 42 and halfway through your first book, first draft. You know, here's here's a little trade secret that I learned from uh, an author. I think it was Ed Greenwood. Um, don't quote me on that one. But I think it was Ed Greenwood at Fan Expo one year. And people were talking about wanting to be an author. And people were saying, like, okay, what's, where do most people, like, fail to get there? And he said that basically 90 to 99% of people, aspiring authors, never finish a novel. Never actually finish. Yes, Elminster author. There we go. That's right. Yeah. So that's where most people end up never getting there. So if you're halfway through, and I think most people don't even make it past the first chapter. If you're halfway through a novel, that is a major, major accomplishment, my friend. Don't let anybody ever tell you any different. So... Uh, let's see. Then there was another question. Ah, how do you handle editing Royal for Royal Road stories? Yes. Okay. So I am a little insane. I do around two to three to four passes. Um, I do a fair amount of editing on my first run through. And then I go through it on a second draft. Then I have a family member look at it. And then we edit it together. And then I post it to Patreon. On the upside, uh, that means that my editors at Athon absolutely love me because the manuscript ends up going to them quite clean. On the downside, and my readers enjoy the nice, uh, mostly edited manuscript. Uh, on the downside is, uh, oh boy, does that take a lot of time? <laughs> An absolute immense amount of time. Not everybody has to do that, but uh, yeah, that's uh, the way I do it. I do a fair amount of editing, I must say. Uh, Richie, you started reading Mark the Fool last night before bed, and you didn't put it down when you should have. It's damn good. Oh, I, that that warms my heart, my friend. Just hearing hearing folks reading my work and just being happy about it, not being able to put it down. It's a humbling feeling. And I just thank, thank you for enjoying it. That's all I can say. Oh, getting a little uh, emotional here, but yeah, let's see. Um, just joining how many books will be in this series and what has been the hardest part of writing this series? Okay. That is an interesting question. So the first part of it is actually rather easy. Um, there's going to be nine books in the series. I'm on Patreon. I'm about halfway through book eight. Now, book eight and nine are probably going to be the longest in the series by somewhere between a little bit to a fair bit. But still, we are getting close to the end. So if you're reading on Amazon, then you're about halfway there, maybe a little over, a little under, depending on the length of those last books. But we are indeed getting toward the end of it. Probably will have finished on Patreon by July of next year, I anticipate. Um, and as for the hardest part, that would be undeniably and you might be thinking, okay, what was the hardest part? Like the event within the book that was hard to write. But truthfully, 
I'm going to say that the hardest part of writing Mark of the Fool has been the schedule. You do not understand like how much you must change your writing habits until you're going for five days a week, my friend. And this is coming from a guy that used to for years, like write like once every couple of weeks, once a month when inspiration struck him and the constellation of Orion was in just the right place. But once I made a commitment to my readers, it completely changed. And I also made a commitment to never miss a day publishing Fool. Um, never taking a break unless I had the proper buffer, buffer, no matter what happened. And let me tell you, that has been punishing, both mentally, physically, and spiritually. I'm incredibly proud of what I've done so far, but quite frankly, I can't recommend it to anyone. People, take care of yourselves. If you're going my way for further serialization, seriously, take breaks, take your time to take your time to self-care don't do what i did kids <laughs> even though i am still rather proud of it um what inspired oh hold on have i ever writing any heron books uh did you mean harem books or heron books i might be misinterpreting the question mr smith um let's see do, 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 do. Ah, it is Heron books. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, I have never written any Heron books, as a matter of fact. Um, the I've read like some fair amount of Japanese rom coms with harem elements, and uh, and uh, what you call it, uh, light novels with the same thing. But I've never written any myself. Um, not sure if I ever will. But as of right now, I don't have any plans. Um, and let's go to Richie. Richie, I might have missed it, but what inspired me to write Mark of the Fool? Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all was a challenge. Um, it was literally a writing challenge. They're like novel write month write-a-thon on Royal Road. And I thought, eh, I'll publish every day. I'll do that for this month and see what happens. And then things got a little carried away from there. But in terms of what's inspired the story, uh, this is a little glib. But what I generally say is that <laughs> the, the main core was I was reading Beware of Chicken at the time. And I was halfway through book one. And my God, I was high off that book. Absolutely. Like I, I, could, I was living and breathing <laughs> Beware of Chicken, my friend. And I'm also a huge fan of Mother of Learning. Um, and I kind of sat there one day and I kind of went, wait a minute. What if they were the same book? <laughs> like he got some of the wholesomeness and slice of life of Beware of Chicken with like the intense sort of um, intense sort of uh, whatchamacallit. Uh, um, Magic Academy elements of Mother of Learning along with the danger. And uh, for some reason, it just got in my head. Add in a little sprinkle of some old ideas that I had that I knitted together, some characters that were inspired from old D&D games that I ran, and bam, you have Mark of the Fool. And uh, also, uh, another thing is that I always did want to write a book where the Chosen One just tells the gods no. Uh, a very, very early version of Fool had actually the, the all of the heroes running away at once, but I couldn't make it work without them all seeming like jerks. So I, I so what to now we got the final version, which is Mark of the Fool. Um, so what are some ways to, ah, yes, Mother of Learning was just wonderful, but what are some ways to better engage with readers on Royal Road? Okay. Everyone has a different style. Personally, I find that talking to readers on Discord and writing personal author's notes for every chapter, or nearly every chapter, has been my main mode of engagement. And also, uh, doing panels and takeovers are pretty nice. <laughs> that has been nice. as well. uh, Joseph, drive to their houses. Um, uh, while funny, uh, that might actually be slightly illegal, depending on how you got that reader information. <laughs> so I can't recommend that, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, might send the wrong message. But yeah, um, the, what else? Uh, some authors um, engage with comments and readers. Um, that 
depends on what kind of auth you are. Sometimes uh, you can have, uh, how can I put this? Sometimes there are times when comment sections, just like they are on YouTube or any other website, can be absolutely punishing. And you have to know that if you have to know that going into any comment section that you have. Um, if you're the kind of author that's like, oh, that's cool. I enjoy the punishment or meh, I don't really care. Then that is for you. Um, sometimes you have to find other ways of engaging. So, but yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, I know for persons of... <laughs> ah, another fa I know of a person whose preferred method of interacting with authors is locking them up in her basement. Ah, the misery method. An old classic. Also illegal. But yes. <laughs> um, would there be any chance of a prequel to Mark of the Fool? Well, let me tell you. Um, I... I'm not sure at the moment. I've had a couple of ideas, but I don't like to make promises unless I absolutely like uh, like dig my heels in and go, yeah, no, no, this is what's happening. Um, Mark of the Fool, I will say, Mark of the Fool takes place on a planet that um, is within a universe that most of my stories take place in. Um, so my next uh, my next two series actually take place in that same universe. And there might be the odd uh, little reference to Mark of the Fool. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my my next series stars a character that did enter Mark of the Fool um, during the Demon Invasion arc. So that was uh, so that's fun. But in terms of prequel, not going to lie, writing a trilogy on Balin's life in his many many tens of thousands of years leading up to the beginning of Mark of the Fool has been bouncing around my head a little bit. But like I said, I can't promise I'm going to write that because I'm not sure if that's even feasible or if I can do that. But yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Not quite sure if uh, I will do that. But, you know, let's never say never. Um, thank you so much. Sorry my daughter was trying to ask my questions for me. I was driving her to ballet. Oh, nice. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, a fool's potential, eh? That would be interesting. Um, I did that with James Hunter. <laughs> oh, I did that with James Hunter. Where was that? I like your books. I'll be there in two hours. Prepare to feed me. <laughs> ah, uh, How do you have so much going on in your head and create it only a character, but a whole world? Plus, did you have that whole story in your head before I started writing? Ah, you actually touched on one of my favorite topics, James. Uh, endings. Um, so I find that um, a lot of... I've always been kind of a person that has like a pretty active imagination and uh, characters often come fully formed into my mind. Um, and, un and many authors will tell you that I'm insane, but most of my stories is all mental. I really don't like taking a lot of notes. Um, it, which is, which trust me, is now biting me in the ass now that I'm eight books into Fool. But other than that, like, I really try to, like, keep all of this stuff in my head. Um, and there's reasons for that that I might be able to get into in another time. But I just really enjoy, like, having it up there. And I find the character voices just tend to come out fairly easily. Um, as for, like, the world and stuff like that, well, I wouldn't say that I had the entire thing plotted out um, before I started Mark of the Fool. Like I said, I had elements here and there that knitted together with my central inspiration to create a story. But what I do do and what I do advocate for was within about five chapters of starting Mark of the Fool, even back when it was just a writing project for Write-A-Thon, I knew the ending of the series. And I strongly advocate for that. And the reason being is that if you know the ending of your series, and this is to all inspiring writers out there, then you know exactly what you need to do to work toward it. So it won't be a situation where it's like, okay, well, I've written myself into a corner or, oh no, I um, didn't manage to, I went one way and now I want to go another way or something like that. 
it's if you know your ending, you can be always working toward it, even with your slice of life arcs. It's like building a road. If you know your destination, then your road will be straight, or even if it becomes winding, you always know which direction to build it. If, uh, if you don't know where your ending is, then when that road gets winding, you're eventually going to end up with a scribble or a knot, because you have no idea where you're going. And you might not ever find your way out of out of your own the own forest that you've built around yourself. But yes, um, do I know? Let's see. Uh, oh my! Uh, five minutes already. Oh, uh, five minutes left already. Let's try and uh, let's try and uh, get to the let's try and get to the last question or so okay do you know how the universe the planet and your characters end oh boy what a strong question the universe no i tend to be the kind of person that likes settings to be living breathing and lasting beyond the measure of one single story probably comes from playing a lot of dungeons and dragons and being just a small part of a living, breathing world in that story. So I like universes to be vast and lasting. Um, as for the planet, um, the I don't know if the planet will. Uh, the planet has a particular destiny to it. Um, I know how it will change, but aside from the astronomical phenomena involving supernovas and the sun, uh, I don't have a set ending for that particular world of fool um and then uh let's see um let's see and then uh there was one more aspect to it there oh uh, yeah and characters end yes um i have i have quasi endings for all my characters i know where their ending is in the story but their lives will go on beyond that and i like to leave those unwritten in case i ever want to return and also so that readers can sometimes put together their own canon of what their future times and adventures will be. And uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, what's your... Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, <laughs> I I try. I definitely do try. Um... <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I do have a scary face. Kind of a stone face, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, okay, and the, the last question, this is easy. I think this will be the last question that we have time for, so I'll just answer it, answer it right from the hip. Um, what's my favorite D&D race slash class combo? Well, uh, despite me writing a story about wizards, I like big, smashy fighters and barbarians. Um, and then I... Um, and for classes, usually some sort of combination of fight, like, so that's classes. And then for races, not going to lie, I drive my DMs crazy by pulling out the monster manual and going, hey, can I play an ogre? Hey, can I play a giant orc? Hey, can I play a, a minotaur or something like that? Like, my longest... <laughs> My longest running character was this orc, like 40k style orc that became a demigod and grew to be about 30 feet tall. My DM was insane, and I love him for it. And I played that character for four years, putting on a Cockney accent the entire time. So yeah, that's me. Love me some monster characters, like seven feet, eight feet tall, and you probably got a race I want to play in D&D. <laughs> but yes, um... Let's see. Let's see. Can you name drop ethical necromancer? In a, not the author. <laughs> Don't call. Listen, 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 listen. Don't call your own story trash. I say as I regularly diss my stories, but uh, don't call your story trash. It's you who creates it, and that makes it special, my friend. But yes, uh, Ethical Necromancer exists. Uh, I don't know if it's good or not, because uh, this is the first time I've heard of it. But uh, I am talking about it. But yes, I believe we have about 30 seconds left. So I'm just going to end off by saying thank you very, very much for coming out. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't staring at a wall for half an hour. <laughs> that was rather nice. You all have been friendly, lovable, fantastic people to have this journey with. And for anyone reading Mark of the Fool or Rune Seeker, I just want to say it has been an incredible journey walking with you all so far. 
and I hope that we can walk on for the end of the series and beyond. And for that, with that, uh, check out my books on Amazon, and I will see you next time, my friends. Goodbye, good night, and good luck. Farewell.